Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us for today's MCAA-sponsored webinar featuring Eric Reynolds and Dr. Suku Nair, who are representing our members at Intertech. Today, our guests are going to detail the best practices for designing safety systems in a cyber threat environment. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you that all the callers have been muted to avoid background noise. However, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, please use the question section of your GoToWebinar toolbar, and we will field them at the end of the presentation. Now, I know that our guests have uh, some introductions of their own, so I'm going to take this opportunity to say it's my pleasure to have you join us today, gentlemen, and turn the uh, stage over to both of you. Eric? Hello? Yes. Hi. Okay. Are you... Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. So, uh, <laughs> hi, uh, as she said, my name is Eric Reynolds, and I'm joined here by one of our cybersecurity technical experts, Dr. Suku Nair. Uh, just a brief background about us before we get started. Um, my background and experience comes in control systems and specifically in mission critical um, scenarios. So, I've uh, done work in uh, UAVs and in the industrial controls. Uh, and specifically with a focus on functional safety. And so I'm bringing kind of the functional safety flavor to this presentation. And then Dr. Nair um, comes with substantial expertise working in cybersecurity, both for government and for industry, uh, and also in an academic background as well. So he's really our heavy hitter when it comes to the technical aspects of the cybersecurity section. So um, we're both very um, honored to be here today and to be speaking with you, and thank you very much for taking the time uh, to join us today. Um, I believe uh, as we get started, uh, I think what I'd like to do first is talk about the two items and how they fit together. So we have functional safety on the one hand, which is really uh, how much can you trust uh, a specific safety system to reduce risk to people or to, or to uh, your finances or to the environment, uh, and hopefully to all three. So that's uh, an area that's been developing in controls for some time now and is really seeing uh, it's entering its heyday with as much as all of our processes are connected and, and uh, as much as we're relying upon them, also as much as society is expecting safe systems 100% of the time. Uh, it's becoming a really uh, critical item for anybody involved in industrial controls or controls of any type for that matter. Uh, and then we also have cybersecurity and anybody who's been watching the news lately can see how from everything from elections to um, uh, botnets that are out there to uh, in the internet of things, as the world becomes more and more connected, cybersecurity becomes more and more essential. And often the problem that people encounter with the interaction of functional safety and cybersecurity is knowing, number one, what the threats are that are out there to your system, knowing how to stay up to date and how to stay timely on those, and then two, knowing how to counter them. Because if you're not a cybersecurity uh, practitioner or professional, uh, it can be a bit daunting to you. And, and so what we're going to do today is run through uh, some examples of different strategies that you can use uh, when you're designing control systems, whether it's at the product or component level, or uh, if you're a systems integrator when you're integrating systems. Uh, we're going to go through some of those technologies uh, that you can use, and then hopefully you'll have an understanding and it won't seem like such a daunting task to incorporate cybersecurity into your, uh, into your design. Uh, unfortunately, what we see a lot of times is people have an awareness about the threat, this nebulous threat out there that's cyber attacks, uh, but they don't know what to do with them. So we see a bit of the uh, ostrich with a head in the sand approach, where you just wait and then figure that you'll do something once something happens. But uh, as we've seen recently, the world is too interconnected now uh, to take that approach anymore. Uh, and so we'll go through that uh, now in a brief example. Uh, perhaps uh, if you've been watching the news lately over the past week, you've heard about what has now become a first time in uh, the cyber world. 
people have been able to orchestrate uh, a global denial of service attack using uh, uh, connected devices. So this is uh, what people have been warning us about for a long time about IoT is you have all of these devices that are connected to one another and to other things. Uh, and now there's been a global, very wide scale hack of these systems, which have then been turn, in turn used to uh, carry out attacks against other service providers. So what basically happened was there was a producer of embedded components back um, coming out of uh, China. All these uh, devices uh, made their way into cameras mostly around the world. Uh, and unfortunately, there was a security lapse in some of the protocols that are used. And uh, the result was that hackers were able to obtain default passwords, default logon information, uh, gather together over the course of time really an army of connected devices, and then to direct them in one attack against several data centers of very prominent sites uh, around the world, even targeting one cybersecurity practitioner specifically. Uh, and really, it's, what, it's uh, been uh, the day that the world has been waiting for, uh, the day when we see the other side of IoT. Uh, and so, as you can see here, there were uh, very simple modules that have been um, included in many products. Uh, these were uh, the ones that were susceptible to attack. And basically, what happened was uh, they all had a default username and password. Uh, that were installed at the factory. And uh, unfortunately, just simple Google searching was able to reveal what that default username and password is. And so once that was realized, the hackers were able to go out and find these devices and eventually take control of them and use them in a concerted way to carry out an attack. Um, these were in security cameras. Uh, they were in various devices that are all around the facility and really highlights uh, one of the more dangerous sides of using uh, connected devices uh, in the world today. So what we'd like to do now is with an understanding of how these connected devices, whether they're used in a control system or used in some network that's connected to a control system, how they can leave uh, you susceptible then dr should drive how you frame the risk that you're experiencing and then having to deal with and manage uh, throughout the life cycle of your of your system so we'll talk a bit about that next really the way a cyber attack works is first uh, a group will focus on system exploitation and there's something out there that you may have heard of called zero day which is where uh, a, uh, a savvy person will dedicate time, sometimes up to months, uh, trying to find vulnerabilities within a system or within components within a system. And then once they find those, uh, they often go out and sell them uh, on the black market to the highest bidder. Uh, and the result then is you have something called a zero day, which allows a new and previously unheard of attack to be uh, to be carried out uh, against systems. Um, that would be kind of a severe case, but there's also other types uh, of attacks that happen through just known vulnerabilities. So the recent botnet attack wasn't a zero-day attack. It was just a really a lapse uh, in the vulnerability of, um, of the components there. So once they have that system exploitation taken care of, they then move into the system and begin transferring uh, different types of malware to be able to uh, either take control of the system or use the system to carry out further attacks. Once then that control is established, uh, then they can go in and really wreak havoc on the system or lie dormant, lie in wait for a while. They may want to seek data that they want to steal. They want, may want to wait and, t and use the control at an op opportune time. Um, or they may then want to move uh, throughout different systems that may be connected to that one. And so with this typical type of anatomy that you see of a cyber attack, you can start to realize, okay, here are some different areas where I can start to address my risk. I can try at the system exploitation level, malware transfer level, I can 
try to detect when someone has entered onto my system or when they're trying to extract data or when someone's moving around in my system. And it's interesting though, this whole process, you may think that it's only done on uh, very high security, high, high, vul um, high impact places, but really uh, you see people doing things hacking into refrigerators, into coffee makers, in this case into cameras, because they can use them then as uh, poorly guarded areas to be able to enter into other systems. And so this is uh, really an example of, of the way the attack happens. Uh, and once you're aware of that, you can start to, to, take, um, to take action. An interesting report that came out recently from Verizon shows that um, usually it, if you find someone on your system, it usually is going to take you over 100 days to be able to realize someone's even on your system. And then after that, it can take you one to 200 days afterwards to be able to get them off of your system. So what you're looking at is an expo a threat exposure of about a year of having someone on your system without even knowing um, and being able to stop them from doing what they're going to do. Uh, and when you take this into account when you're talking about designing safety systems, um, the impacts can be even higher. Uh, and so really that's how we're going to start talking about framing our risk going forward. There is some industry guidance that is uh, currently being developed and published uh, for handling cybersecurity in industrial control systems. Uh, the IEC 62443 series focuses on four levels of, uh, uh, of accommodation for these different types of attacks. It goes all the way down from the component level, which is what we saw with uh, the recent botnet level, uh, and then on up to if you're a systems integrator, how do you employ different security levels and zones, and different uh, security technologies uh, to protect against these attacks. Even goes up to an organizational level where then you have different ways to manage cybersecurity within an organization or at a certain facility. And so I'd encourage you to, uh, if you're interested, take a look at several of these and, uh, and how they might pertain to your particular systems. Um, what we're going to do now is focus in on uh, really some of the specific technologies that are out there. Some of them you may have heard of before, like of course everyone's uh, accustomed to password protection and those sort of things, but other ones are a little more complex. And really what we'd like to do is give you a flavor of the standard protection mechanisms that are out there so that you can then start to think about how they might impact your system. And so with that, I'm going to um, hand the control over to Dr. Nair to go through these uh, some of these different uh, types of, of technologies and, and hopefully we can uh, learn a bit from it. What I'd like to do is say if you do have questions about any of these specific technologies, uh, you can go ahead and enter them in and uh, we'll be sure at the end to respond and address to any of those. Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon. So it looks like uh, Eric gave a very good introduction. So I think that's a good segue into talking about technology. Uh, if I could uh, kind of uh, rephrase what uh, Eric said, you know, when, whenever you look at the uh, security posturing of an enterprise, you know, people try to divide that into three different pieces, you know, people, process, and technology. So Eric has been talking mainly about people and process, even those, you know, we can take, we can have one weekend workshop on these things. You know? So I'm just going to take 20 minutes to talk about the technology piece. And good thing here is, you know, Eric uh, himself put together some pieces which he thought will be most appropriate for this audience. And then I'm going to go through these slides. And again, like I said, we can talk about these things in detail, but I will try to uh, compress the discussion to what, 20 minutes? 20 minutes, and if you have any questions, then we'll be happy to come back and talk more about it. So the first one is authentication authorization. Uh, if you will, uh, that happens to be the beginning and end of security. You know, and quite often when you really talk about authentication authorization, people do confuse these two words and sometimes they will use uh, synonymously. But the difference between these two things is authentication is actually looking at who goes in there. For example, when you use your password to get in, the system is kind of bidding you to make sure that you are supposed to be going in there. Whereas authorization means what goes there. Once you get in there, what are the different resources you have access to? That's what is controlled by authorization. The technologies we use for those things are very different. And uh, let me quickly go through 
uh, some of these uh, technical terms uh, uh, given the table. For example, when you look at role-based, uh, it is actually uh, authorization. You know, the idea is this. You know, let's let's talk about uh, uh, a big hospital. Uh, there there will be thousands of physicians, uh, maybe even more uh, nurses, and then other staff and people like that. Uh, and and if you really look at the information that that can and be accessed by these people, it's a huge number of records. At the same time, there are a lot of privacy issues, security issues, so you have to make sure that only those people who are uh, qualified to uh, look at this information can have access to it. At the same time, if you really put an access control matrix or authorization list for every entity you have in the system, it is going to explode. So you cannot do that. So that's when people came up with this role-based uh, uh, authorization. The idea there is, for example, if you are a physician at a certain level, all physicians at that level may have similar access, you know, uh, uh, or, or all nurses at a certain level will have access to certain information. So the idea is you can keep a much smaller table uh, but still have a reasonable control on who gets the access to uh, information. So that's why, you know, we say it's a reduced complexity, uh, lower operating costs, and at the same time, you know, there are a lot of issues there, you know, because the, 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 the roles will keep changing and sometimes, you know, there will be people coming from other places. And nowadays, the biggest problem is, you know, especially in that, that scenario I, I gave as an example, uh, you will have people uh, collaborating from different enterprises, different hospitals, different clinics, and you know, then that, that becomes uh, kind of an issue. Then comes the big thing, the password. So I will, I will combine... Uh, the password, physical token, and uh, uh, smart card, and biometric into one thing. These are all access control mechanisms. You know, when you look at access control mechanisms, there are three different things that you can look at. One is, how do you give access to somebody? Uh, you can base it upon what do you know. That, for example, it's a password or a password is what do you know. And then sometimes it's based on what do you have, a smart card is an example for what you have, because you have to possess that to get access to the system or to the building or whatever it is. And then biometric, that's what you are. You know, you are fingerprint or uh, uh, retina scan or whatever it is, right? That's biometric. Uh, having all these different possibilities for access control, even now passwords are the most popular way of access control. Uh, only reason for that is that's the cheapest. You know, because it's uh, the, uh, the making a password does not cost you anything. And if you, if somebody forgets the password, you can always, you know, replace it. Whereas if it's a smart card, somebody loses a smart card, two things happen. One, you have to make sure that somebody else uh, doesn't get access. Second, you have to replace with a physical entity that smart card. So system admin people do not like it. And the biometric, even now, it's a very expensive proposition. That's why we don't see it there. And many people are a little bit worried about, which is not really uh, true that people think, you know, okay, if I lose my fingerprint, I mean, I can replace it. <laughs> so I don't want to give my fingerprint. That's not the case. You know, there is enough security mechanism, and it's not just that somebody can steal it. You know, there are ways of compromising biometrics, but still it's very difficult. But right now, you don't see biometric that often, mainly because it's very expensive. But, you know, things are coming in, you know, like in smartphones and all, you know, people are using uh, biometric. And then uh, location-based and device, device to device. You know, uh, you can uh, lump all those things into context aware security. You know, depending upon where you are, uh, you may have different types of access rights. You know, uh, there are a lot of mechanisms, you know, like DPS fencing and uh, so many other parameters, you know, sensor-based parameters you can use. And device to device becomes very, very important, especially for IoT. You know, uh, Eric talked about this uh, recent attack. And uh, that again, you know, sometimes you, know, you can have devices on the system uh, which is not uh, clearly authenticated. That that not only for IoT, even 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 backend uh, uh, communication networks, that's a big problem. You know, you cannot have a, a router sitting there which is not authenticated. You know, it can it can wreak havoc in our communication system. So if you can go to the next slide now, all right. So those are about access control. Now comes uh, filtering, blocking. Uh, with respect to the the uh, packets that's going around in the in the in the system, so firewall, if you will, uh, is one of the most well-known security appliances out there. And I would say people have done a phenomenal marketing job in in calling it firewall. And it's almost like a security in a box. 
you know, people think, you know, just by spending a lot of money on a firewall, you have security. That's not the case. <laughs> you, know, you can have the best firewall, but if it is misconfigured or not configured properly, you won't have the security. It's almost like having the best uh, uh, lock or best gate in front of your house. But if it's unlocked, you know, there is no point in having that, 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 that fence or that gate. Uh, uh, firewalls again comes in so many different forms. You know, here he has put uh, two different things. Uh, uh, there are a few more uh, variations, but uh, idea being, you can filter the the information that is going around in so many different layers of the network. You know, if it's at the packet level, we we we, we call it uh, packet level firewalls. Sometimes it's the, it's the next layer, that's the, the the transport layer. At that time, it is a little bit more. Uh, uh, secure, uh, but more complex. Uh, and then firewall can also be at the network level, or it could be on your on your desktop or in the, on the on the host itself. You know, uh, both have its own advantages and disadvantages. If you have host level firewall, you can customize it. Whereas uh, uh, if you do not have a network level firewall, things are going to come to your host anyway. Whereas the the network level firewalls are a little bit you know proactive defense. Against against enterprise uh, system, and then we have this uh, fabulous concept of virtual uh, local area networks. This again was invented uh, to provide some kind of logical separation between different types of traffic that goes in the network. For example, uh, if you are looking at a company which which may have uh, uh, a financial division versus marketing division versus you know. Um, technology division, and sometimes you know, you'll have some confidential information that goes around in one particular uh, uh, division, which the other division should not be seeing. It. At that time, you know, uh, having separate physical network is very expensive. So right now, with the v uh, VLANs, you can you can have that capability. At the same time, the investment is much much less because you still have the same physical network at the same time. Virtually, it is going to appear as different network for different people who are on the network. You know, but at the same time, it is not completely secure. There are different ways of jumping from one VLAN to another. Again, that's a, a good discussion in a different different webinar. <laughs> uh, where did I go? Okay. Now comes the concept of encryption. Uh, whenever we talk about electronic uh, security, cybersecurity, we cannot have any security without the basic encryption tools. You know, encryption is the, the basis of almost any security service we can uh, accomplish. Then again, uh, it is so easy to say, okay, we can we can encrypt and then make things happen. But the thing is, uh, there are so many different types of encryption, and then the way we apply encryption is going to depend upon what kind of security service we want. You know, one of the things that we haven't put on the slide is uh, there's a concept called CIA. It doesn't stand for the actual CIA. It stands for confidentiality, integrity, and uh, availability or authenticity. So those are the basic services we try to accomplish using uh, cryptographic methods. And the reason for separating them, sometimes you know, people do not see that difference, especially people outside cybersecurity, they will think security means confidentiality. But that's not the case. Sometimes you know, we can send information openly, but we want to make sure that nobody changes it. At that time, integrity becomes important. And sometimes we don't care for any of those things. We just want to make sure that things are authentic, right? It is coming from the right people. Even if you know, a few bits are flipped, you know, we can still recover uh, data from it. Uh, but in some cases, we want to have all of them at the same time. Then we have to use combination of different techniques to achieve these things. And here we have put uh, two different types of encryption. Uh, you may see this uh, quite often. Symmetric encryption is the conventional encryption scheme. The idea there is the sender and receiver will share a secret. And then that secret is the key you use to do the encryption. And then once you encrypt it and send the information to the receiver, he has the advantage compared to any uh, eavesdropper because they don't have the key. So only way they can get the actual plain text is uh, brute forcing the key. So that takes a lot of time. Whereas the, the, the receiver has the key and so he can easily go through the decryption process, he gets it. So what are the different types of uh, schemes you will see out there? Uh, DES and triple DES, they're the old ones. And now we have AES, you know, AES is the standard. It stands for uh, Advanced Encryption uh, Standard. Uh, they use 128 bit keys and the block size of 128. And then you could even increase the key size to 256 or 512 bits and things like that, depending upon what kind of security you need. Uh, you know, uh, the, the idea with uh, uh, AES is 
uh, you get confidence share at the same time if it is not implemented properly sometimes you may not get the security so I will not go get, get into the details of it because I want to explain what the public key uh, uh, encryption is there is a clear deviation from this conventional encryption you know the problem with the encryption I just talked about the AES uh, there is a catch-22 problem with it that is you cannot have a confidential channel between the sender and the receiver unless you have already shared a secret so the question is how did you share that secret <laughs> if you knew how to share that secret why can't you use the same technique to send the information to the 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 answer to that is the the secret you are sharing there is a small secret which is a key whereas after that once you have the key you can share bigger secrets like a bigger file or whatever it is right for a long time uh, whereas in public infrastructure the, the idea is you should be able to connect to somebody with whom you have never communicated before for example for the first time if you are going to let's say Amazon website you should be able to establish a secure connection so how do you do that because you are not sharing any information there so that is where the public key cryptography will come into place the idea with that is with public key cryptography the sender and the receiver both of them have two sets of keys you know, uh, everybody participating in encryption, they'll have a public key, and there is a corresponding private key too, right? Similarly, the receiver will also have a public key and a private key. Just by the name of public key itself, and it's public, everybody knows it. So if I want to send you something confidentially, only thing I need to know is your public key. I will encrypt it using your public key, which nobody can decrypt other than you, because you are the only one who has a corresponding private key. So th that's why that's kind of an asymmetric encryption because you encrypt with one key and decrypt with another key. And, you know, it, it's much more to it because this is a neat encryption in the sense if I encrypt something with my private key, anybody can open it, right? Because my public key is known to you all. So if you use my public key, you can, you can decrypt it. The idea with that encryption is I'm sending you something with encryption using my private key so that I can authenticate that it is coming from me. So you can verify this is coming from me by using my public key. That is a facility which is not available for symmetric key. See, in, in symmetric key, the problem is this. Uh, if two people have the same key, any one of them can encrypt their data. So I could encrypt their data and later say that, no, it's not me, you send it. So there is no non-repudiation there. I can repudiate that I did not send it, right? Whereas in uh, public infrastructure, you cannot do that. So there are a lot of benefits there. So how does the whole thing work together? In SSL, for example, when we connect to Amazon, when you connect to IBM, whatever, or Intertech, you know, you see that HTTPS, that's an SSL connection, that's a secure connection. So the way that we establish that connection is use public key cryptography to establish a secret first, and then use secret key encryption to, to make it confidential. So public key is always very expensive computationally, whereas complex very complex whereas a secret key is much less complex so the idea is use the complex scheme to share the secret first and then use the less complex scheme to uh, make it uh, continuously confidential and then uh, the the concept of virtual private network is used by all enterprises especially companies like Intertech, which has a lot of uh, uh, sales people sales force and marketing people you know out in the field so if they want to connect to the enterprise you know, they cannot just use an open connection so what they do is this virtual private network is extending the corporate network to uh, the, the field. That way they will have access to all the confidential information, the web servers and the database servers and things like that. Different techniques are used. You know, uh, one of the, the most popular VPN used is based upon IPsec, which is at the network layer, uh, whereas, you know, uh, less expensive based SSL VPN, which is getting more and more popular now. Uh, 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 less expensive plus the maintenance is much easier yeah all right so monitoring and detecting this again is an important uh, tool for a security security person in any any company the idea is very simple how do we know there is a security problem you know most of the time you know the way it works is we log everything that happens to the system if you go and look at uh, the log you can see different signatures you know you, you may see people who are not supposed to be there you may see processes which are not supposed to be running and those are the uh, uh, any kind of uh, discrepancy you see you will identify that as okay there has been some kind of intrusion and then you know depending upon the signature in it you know you can you can determine what kind of 
uh, intrusion happened and you may be able to contain it, you may be able to uh, recover from it, and there are so many different things you can do. But at the same time, you know, it's not that easy. You know, especially with the kind of speeds and the kind of information that is being exchanged between different parties here. I mean, you're talking about a huge amount of data. Even the log information is so much. And there are many companies I personally have audited, security audited. You know, they will have uh, all the tools to capture the log. And then there is one guy uh, in the whole enterprise who will be looking through the log. And you know, well, one day when I went there, he was on leave. In the last one week, he hasn't looked at the log. And so the idea is there could be something happening to the company's uh, IT system, and nobody knows what's going on. He may come back and look through it. So the idea being, uh, it is not good enough to capture the data. You know, you should understand what is it for. It is it is to determine whether there has been any kind of anomalous activities going on, and then you have to you have to detect it. And nowadays, you know, companies use very sophisticated. They call it SIEM, you know, uh, uh, security uh, uh, event information management systems. You know, the idea is it's a it's a holistic system where they capture the log, and then put through a lot of analytics process, and there will be a dashboard to tell people, you know, you can just look at it and then say, okay, there is some problem here or there is some activity happening here. You know, these are all the, the remedial things you know, we have to do and things like that. So there's so much business out there, you know, people trying to build this kind of sophisticated space. And nowadays people are saying that if you really look at the amount of data that is being collected, you know, manual inspection is not good enough. So they are running uh, some kind of uh, data mining uh, through it to determine whether there are any issues with it. Uh, please stop me if you if you're running out of time. Yeah. How secure is? Oh, okay. So should I spend some more time on this? No, I think I think that's uh, you've done a good job capturing that there. I think that the keys that you brought up were were really pertinent. You've got three aspects to it. You've got the technology aspect, which you've talked through many of the technologies that are out there, uh, and then you've got the policies and the personnel issues as well that go into. Uh, establishing security, robust security for any network, whether it's an enterprise level network or whether it's uh, a dedicated control system. Uh, the, the same concepts, the same technologies still apply. But the real question that most people encounter is, okay, we've seen all of these different technologies and we could go out uh, and invest our entire company budget in trying to employ all of these, all of these types of protection. But the question is, how much do I need to actually uh, prevent these attacks? How much do I need to mitigate my risk to a level that I'm comfortable with? And that's really where the wisdom comes in. Uh, being able to understand where your system is exposed and what you can do to mitigate it. And that's what helps you, helps you sleep at night. So we're gonna talk a little bit now in this section on how to know how secure is secure. How, or another way to say it is, when do I have enough uh, and perhaps Dr. Nair or someone would say you never have enough. I don't, I don't know from a, from a technical perspective specifically if you can ever reach absolute certainty that you will not be hacked. But um, there are levels that you can achieve which make you a harder target than other people. So for instance, on my street, if I don't want a burglar to break into my house, then I don't necessarily have to make my house into Fort Knox. What I do is have to make my house more difficult to break into than my neighbor's house. And then the robber won't go to me, he'll go to my neighbor's house. And it won't make for very happy homeowners association meetings, but at least, uh, at least my, my place will be secure. So what you want to do is establish a level of security that's appropriate. Uh, and really what, you, what it's based upon is uh, risk tolerance. And not only the risk tolerance of an individual person or even of a company, but of society. So for instance, uh, if you have a a facility that's controlling, a control system that is in charge of a nuclear reactor, then society is very averse to any level of risk going into that system. And so in that case, you may be spending quite a bit and investing quite a bit in continual upkeep of cybersecurity to a very high level. But on the other hand, uh, say I have a coffee maker in my, in my kitchen that is in a connected device. The individual homeowner may not want to invest that much in it. And there's everything in between on the scales. So depending on what you're controlling, on, depending on what your exposure is, uh, it really helps to dictate where uh, you should invest your funds. 
But really, it all starts with understanding what is my risk and what am I, what kind of risk can I tolerate, as the risk will never go to zero. And not only uh, what is my risk right now or what has it been in the past, but what's it going to be in the future. Uh, as my systems continue to modernize and change, as the rest of the systems out in the world that I'm connected to tend to change, what is my future risk going to be? And then building in processes so that what you can do is make sure that you stay ahead of the game. And then finally, what actions can I take to reduce my risk? So the idea of managing cyber risk is very similar to managing a safety risk or managing an environmental risk or a financial risk. What you have to do is understand where you are and where you need to be, uh, and then take appropriate action. It's an interesting thing. Uh, I mentioned this Verizon study earlier in our webinar, uh, but there's actually been studies for how much uh, impact, financial impact, is done uh, dur as a result of a breach. Now, this is specifically related more towards point of sale transactions. Uh, think ATM machines or credit card machines, and and those sort of things, uh, but the, the principle is the same. Uh, you can actually assign a financial value to a breach, and in an industrial control system, that financial value can be tied to uh, an interruption of business continuity, meaning if you're generating power for a city, what happens when you lose power for a few hours or days because you've had a breach? Uh, it can be damage uh, to equipment or personnel if you have a breach and someone is malicious enough to try to cause some sort of accident or catastrophe. What is the impact there? It can be an impact uh, to the environment. Um, if for some reason um, the breach results in, uh, in, in a spill of some sort of chemical or some impact on the environment, you can quantify those risks just like you would any other risk. Uh, and then you can put a dollar value to them, which helps you understand uh, how much you should invest, right? The difficulty is, as with any other type of risk assessment, the numbers get pretty big pretty fast. And so uh, understanding a realistic value for your expected loss and then perhaps a high-end value for a catastrophic loss, those can really be used to drive your risk assessment effort. And so really what it's about as we, as we kind of wrap up this section of the webinar and move on to questions is uh, it's staying ahead of the game. So as we just saw at the beginning of the webinar, we have uh, IoT, which has been the buzzword in the industry for five, six years now, uh, and everyone has been warning of the potential for a massive coordinated attack using these devices. Now it has happened. Now we've seen it come to fruition. And uh, there are people out there who've stayed ahead of the game and who were ready for it, and there were people out there who were not. Uh, the majority of us were not ready. And so really what, it is, what it's about here is, uh, now that we know this threat is out there, what can we do about it in our own systems? And then also, as we continue to, how are we gonna continue to stay advised um, as to what other threats are developing out there? And really it goes back to if you've studied quality systems at all, you, you know that really what you do is you make plans, you go out and take action, you monitor and diagnose when things happen, and then you go back and you take action again to update your plan. So cybersecurity is certainly not a one and done project. It's an ongoing effort uh, to maintain the security of your system for both uh, your customers and for anyone else who might be a stakeholder. So I think uh, that's uh, the uh, the end of our slides that we had here. Uh, I'd like to open it up if we have any questions now um, about perhaps the specific technologies we talked about or uh, about potential threats to the system. Uh, now would be a great time to do that. All right, Eric, I do have one question for you. Um, how does the IEC standard compare to the UL 2900 standard? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the IEC standard that's there was in part based upon many other standards that uh, are out there. So, for instance, ISA has done a lot of work in developing their standards, uh, and that has been taken as the beginning starting point for these international standards. Specifically relating to that question, I don't. I could look that up and uh, and go and uh, and get an answer to that for you, but I don't know it right off the top of my head. No. 
So, uh, what I can sorry. what I can do is email you um, the the participant's name, and maybe you can get in touch that way. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, okay. It sounds like uh, they've been perhaps designing some systems based off that standard, and wanted to know how it how it coordinates with the others. So uh, we'd yeah, be happy to. When we talk about enterprise security, uh, mainly the standards uh, usually uh, come apart: the ISO standards and uh, NIST standard, IFIP. Uh, SOX, uh, SAS-70, uh, but this could be very specific to uh, somebody, a specific application. Yeah, I think th that that really, um, the underlying technologies and the methods are the same across all the different standards. Uh, it's specific to the implementation, though, is where a lot of the more specific standards go. Okay. Let's see. Well, um, I've had one question come in. It's actually one for me. If, if we had some folks join us late, um, I have recorded this session, so we will make it available to you um, by the end of the day uh, as soon as it's available from GoToWebinar. Um, let's give you guys a couple of minutes to think. If you'd rather just talk to our speakers instead of typing in your question, uh, use your hand icon on your toolbar, and I'll be happy to unmute your mic. <clears throat> They're awfully quiet today, gentlemen. <laughs> well, what we'll do is we'll give you a couple more seconds to either raise those hands or, or send out a question. But as I said, the, the session has been recorded. Gentlemen, it was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much for joining uh, and participating and supporting MCAA today. We've had a, a great group of participants uh, listening in on your conversation, and I'll be happy to share that list with you. Um, look for an email um, from the measure.org domain by the end of the day for your Dropbox download link for the recording. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to not only thank our speakers, but also our MCAA members and all of the guests who have joined us today for the presentation. And uh, at this time, gentlemen, I don't have any additional questions for you, um, but I'm sure that if they come up with something, um, would it be okay if I shared your email address with the audience? Sure, but you have to use uh, you have to use uh, encryption to do so. <laughs> oh, so we have to wait. We have to have a secret first, and then we have to have a key. Uh, we have to share the key first. <laughs> I was listening. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Well, we don't have any other questions, so uh, we will be able to share the presenter's contact information and uh, along with the recording download link uh, again by the end of the day. So thanks again for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you for your time and your effort in putting together the presentation. And uh, from all of us here at MCAA, we wish you a, a great afternoon and look forward to your participation with us again in the future. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.